as I held this word this week and this idea, it began to reveal itself to me in a very fun way. All stands for, to me, always witnessing everything. So I kind of played this game this week to just remember I am always witnessing everything. Reverend Sherry read a, a really beautiful reading this morning and it reminded me of my grandfather. As I began to think about, I have um, sort of an innate, my partner told me that it's like I'm ingrained with a natural sprig of curiosity. I have a curiosity for life and that helps keep my sense of awe alive. And I began to think about that. Where did that come from? And it can, comes from a lot of uh, my parents, but my grandfather in particular. My grandfather was a hardworking man, uh, never really had a lot of worldly possessions, but he was one of the happiest people you've ever met. It did not matter to him if you were a doctor or a ditch digger. He would invite you to dinner. He would take interest in you. He could care less about anything else. He had, his pet was a squirrel monkey, for heaven's sakes, Barney. <laughs> My grandfather had a monkey as his pet. It was fascinating as a child. And he would do things like he would gather up reeds and make cane poles and, and would take us to dig fishing worms and go fishing. He just had the zest for life. He'd have my grandmother pack sandwiches and we'd go to the airport and just sit in our car and watch airplanes and he'd say, where do you think they're going? Or he'd say, I want you to get out and climb up on the car and jump off and see if you can fly. <laughs> kind of grandfather I had and he'd say you can't fly can you no we can't granddaddy and he'd say well God told somebody how to do that he looked at life like that when he'd see an airplane always witnessing everything living in that state of awe. the world needs us not only to always witness everything because we are always witnessing everything but to always witness everything and to be able to see God in all things. When I lived on Maui, the last, almost the last year, I had the opportunity to uh, form my own business, which was called Spirit in Touch. And little did I know that it would be such a great teacher. One day I was with my little dog, Zoe, and it dawned on me, I felt like she was kind of communing with me, and it dawned on me that Spirit in Touch is S-I-T, sit. And I looked over at her sitting there. I'm like, you're so, more, so much more connected with the divine. But as a part of my work, I would work with individuals. And, and through that experience, I began to be able to see, some call it your third eye, but just it's, it's all of us have the capacity to do it. It's being able to see at different levels of your being. And so I may be talking to an individual usually on the telephone, so I couldn't see them. I didn't know anything about them, but just as soon as I heard their voice, I began to see images and energy. And because of that, could guide them and help them shift a little bit and maybe see something in a different way. Well, what I consistently began to see was no matter who was talking to me that had an issue, no matter what the issue it was, it was as if there was a gigantic mountain in front of them. And all they could see was this huge mountain. But if they could slightly shift just a little bit and reconnect and remember that I'm always witnessing everything. And am I plugged in and connected to this circumstance, this drama, this issue that is in front of me? Or if I can back away just long enough and really reconnect like the Native American student who drops to his knees and realizes that no matter where I am, no matter what situation, God is present. God is always here. And can I remember the truth of who I am and the truth that all things are possible and that I can never be separated from my creator or from my good. And as they could begin to really connect with that, what began to help and happen in the image that I saw was a shift in perspective or, or perception they began to get so big and so filled with the truth of who they were that what happened to the mountain it went shoop and they went like this when Jesus said you can speak to this mountain and this mountain shall be moved it didn't necessarily mean that the mountain was going to go poof and disappear to dust it meant that you were going to connect with the presence and the power and the truth of who and what and why you are to such an extent that the mountain would no longer be a mountain in your life Always witnessing everything. 
when the great library of Alexandria burned down, as the story goes, there was one book left. It was sold, and the individual that bought this book just had a feeling and bought it. My battery just died. They told me it was going to happen. Now I have to stand still. I get to stand still. I'll go back to my notes. <laughs> the one book was left. One man bought it. It wasn't even an interesting book, but in going through it, there was a little cloth, a little piece of cloth paper. And it held the secret of the sacred pebble. Now, according to the legend that was written on this little piece of paper, it said that there is one secret, sacred pebble. And it told it was out on this ocean amongst hundreds and thousands of other pebbles. But if you could find the one sacred pebble, you would know it because it was warm. And if you ever found the warm pebble, the story said you could take it and touch anything that was base metal and it would turn to gold. This man was elated. He found this secret. So he went to the beach and he spent days and weeks and months. And as the story goes on, he even spent a few years of his life. He'd pick up a pedal, pebble, it's cold, he'd throw it. Pick it up, it's cold, he'd throw it. Pick it up, it's cold, he'd throw it. Over and over and over. One day he picked up a pebble and it was warm. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> the moral of the story is that every day we hold the opportunity to turn base metal, the ordinary, into gold right in our hand. But we've become so conditioned, the habit of our life, the conditions of our life cause us to go from mechanical. We're in a mechanical mode. The presence of awe, when we can hold that capacity, we can shift from the mechanics of our life and reconnect with the mystical of our life. Dr. John Izzo, said he was home one day working on an important report for a client and his daughter Sydney was home with him and John said he was working on this report and Sydney came in and said dad dad you have to come outside look there's a bug that's red and black and it's right on our driveway and he said that's nice Sydney but I have to get this report done dad dad you have to come outside now there's a bug and it's red and it's black and it's right on our driveway he said honey I don't have time to do that right now. The bug will just have to wait. He said she looked appalled and said, Daddy, bugs do not wait for us. <laughs> he said in that moment, her naive wisdom grabbed him. And he said, you know what? This report can wait for two or three minutes. And so he stood up and he went out with his daughter, Sydney, and sure enough, he said it was actually a little caterpillar. It was one of the most magnificent that you could possibly imagine. And it was red and it was black and it was right on their driveway. And years later, he said, I can't tell you a thing in the world about the report that I wrote, whether the client was happy or not, but I will always remember that bug. And most importantly, I will always remember that time with my daughter. Always witnessing everything. In this book, the evidence of the afterlife and a radiation oncologist Dr. Jeffrey Long in his research stumbled across the term near death experience and as a doctor he said that fascinated him because as a doctor as a scientist you were either dead or alive there was no such thing as a near death experience that's like being sort of pregnant you either are or you are not <laughs> So in his very scientific manner, he set about to prove this. It led to a dramatic change in his life. He said, because of the research I've done, I am today a much better doctor than I've ever been. But more than that, I am a believer. It's a fascinating book because it is written by a couple of scientists and they documented over 1,600 cases of individuals with near-death experiences, meaning that they were pronounced dead and came back.